going to change the pace a, a bit from the talks that have been presented already. Um, that's partly because I'm not a clinician. I'm a social psychologist who, you know, just pretends to be an interventionist sometimes. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> I've spent too much time on planes in the last three days. I'm sure many of you guys can sympathize. Um, and I'll just tell you about kind of the way that I and my lab have been thinking about behavior change broadly, including change um, for you know, use of substances, but not only that, um, in terms of trying to kind of develop a general model uh, for how you know, behavior change <coughs> might look. Um, and where we've gone with this is that we, we think there's, I mean, from the kind of 30,000 uh, foot perspective, there's at least two, I mean, I think actually there, there are exactly two um, kind of big considerations here. Um, and yeah, you'll know, we are not the first people to kind of notice this, but this is, a, I think, a useful way of how we are conceptualizing the work in our lab. Just that in order to change behavior, in order to do something new, something that you haven't done before, um, maybe try to make it into a habit, um, you need two pieces. First, there's the will, right, which I mean, by that I mean the desire to do it, uh, the motivation. And there's lots of different flavors of motivation. We can go, you know, I'll go into some of those. But just broadly speaking, um, what the will refers to is the, the wanting. Um, and perhaps that could be measured by something like your willingness to pay for that. Um, the other piece that you need is what we're calling the way, the cognitive capacity, skills, knowledge, ability to do it. Um, and that self-regulation really requires these two pieces. This is the way we think about it. And, and a big insight for us, anyway, um, for many of the behaviors that we study was that there is sometimes an asymmetry here. Um, some behaviors that you are trying to change are technically difficult. Um, and so in those cases, you might want to put emphasis on the way, the kind of knowledge and skills, and, and basically do like a skill building intervention. On the other hand, many of the behaviors that we are interested in and want to change are actually quite easy, um, technically speaking. Uh, think about uh, eating, eating. Um, everyone knows how to eat healthfully, right? It's like, or I mean, that's an overgeneralization. But you're at a buffet. We know what the healthy options are. We know what the unhealthy options are. You know what you're supposed to do. It's not sort of physically demanding. You don't need to have a huge working memory capacity or you know incredibly good response inhibition to be able to put salad on your plate and physically eat it, right? So that would be a case where we're like, okay, this is a, a matter of motivation, basically. And so a lot of what we think about is you know, how do we kind of assess where we are in the space? And then how do you build or how do you even start to think about building interventions that would target one or the other of these things? So today I'll just talk about the lines of the work, um, where we've been, where we're going, um, talk about some cognitive uh, pathways, cognitive interventions that we've done. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the way we think about motivations and, and the, the interventions that we're starting to do that target motivation. Um, and I'll kind of wrap up if there's time. Um, you know, there's never time. Uh, okay, so the way, so the cognitive factors, as I mentioned, these are cognitive skills, things like, uh, you know, knowledge, cognitive capacities. And for a while, um, when we launched this line of work, this was really hot, you know, maybe you guys have heard about brain training uh, or something like lumosity, right? I mean, to me, that's like the, and we all laugh, but I mean, at some point, people were really thinking this was promising. Um, it's like, okay, these are skills, you know, wh why can't we just teach people to do them and they'll get better at them? Um, and so, as I mentioned, it's, a, it's clearly a prerequisite for, for effective self-regulation. Um, and so we started by thinking or searching for theoretical models that would try to, you know, sort of indicate how you would go about training these things. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a social psychologist, so I'm obsessed with theory and, you know, can't do anything without a theory. Uh, so I'm like, oh, how do you do this? Okay, so a theoretical model that was quite popular um, uh, it, it is, remains quite popular, is the strength model, the strength model of self-control um, associated with uh, Roy Baumeister, Kathleen Boss, Diane Tice. Um, the, the main predictions of the strength model, well, one is that, the big one is that there's this kind of common resource, unspecified uh, resource, that, that sort of allows us to engage in self-control. Um, and one, you know, the famous kind of corollary of that is that that resource is depleted, depletable, like a tank of gas. You use it up, it's gone, then you can't engage in self-control anymore. Um, that's been controversial. It doesn't actually appear to be the case. Um, but the other prediction of this model is that it's, re it's domain general. Regardless of whether it's depletable, this idea is if you are good at self-control in one domain, say uh, controlling your emotions, 
you might be also good at self-control in you know controlling your behavior, um, smoking or you know eating or something like that. So that's kind of the idea of the, the strength model. We started there, and so our idea was well maybe we can train this, right? Maybe you can whatever that resource is, you can make it stronger. Um, they often will use the metaphor of a muscle actually. So take it to the gym, you know your muscles get stronger, and then you'll be better at self-control in all these domains. So, um, so this is what we, we tried to do. We tried to train self-control um, very much basically following the go to the gym model. Um, we took a task that we know requires self-control. Uh, it's, it's a response inhibition task. And we had people practice it. Um, and we hypothesized that people would get better. Um, in what ways would they get better? Uh, this is another place where this model, I mean, I, I'm picking on this model, but it's sort of a very common in social psychology. It's completely underspecified. Right? We don't, the model doesn't tell you how it gets better, what's the mechanism. I mean, using the muscle analogy is interesting. Um, it, it's interesting in how much it reveals how little we know, right? Because you can go to human physiology and you can ask somebody that knows these things, you know, how does a muscle, how do you get stronger when you exercise your muscles? And they'll, they'll go on and on, you know, they'll write you a book about like, well, here's what happens and, you know, this muscle changes in this way, these other things grow, right? Cells change. How does it happen when we get better at things, at self-control and the, at the level of the brain? Well, okay, neurons are not muscle tissue. I know that. Um, that's basically all we know. <laughs> like, well, we don't know. Um, well, could it be a, you know, the sort of one prediction might be you'll see greater bold activation, so more blood flow, more glucose consumption, maybe. Um, maybe it's an efficiency story. Maybe the same neurons use less energy. Uh, so maybe actually bold activation will go down. Uh, we don't know. So this was a big question that we wanted to answer, and we, we didn't even really conjecture many hypotheses. Um, there is a model in cognitive neuroscience by Todd Braver that, that kind of gets at this. Uh, he, he talks about dual, he calls it dual mechanisms. It's more like dual sort of modes of control. Um, he calls it modes sometimes. Uh, and the idea is that control can be, when you're engaging in something like self-control, it can happen earlier in time, um, kind of in, in anticipating the need for control in sort of a proactive way. It can happen later in time in sort of a reactive way. So you can think of this as uh, you know, trying to stop your car by slamming on the brakes when the light turns red, or gradually slowing yourself down by braking when the light turns yellow. Right? So we've learned that when the light turns yellow, it's not red yet, but it's gonna be red soon, so I better start early, and it's sort of uh, you know, more efficient in certain ways. Um, so you know, perhaps with training, we would see something like this. You'd see some cues uh, that indicate when control is needed, you know, parallel to the yellow light. Um, and then you'd basically have associative learning, right? You would learn that that cue predicts stopping. Um, it's a little different than associative learning classically because you're not really getting rewarded in any way other than, you know, sort of successfully stopping. Um, and it's sort of an interesting question whether you can learn to associate a cue with not doing a behavior, right? So that's kind of an interesting little wrinkle. Um, there's some animal literature on this, but that, that it, you know, it's sort of an interesting question for self-control research in general is can you learn to be better at essentially stopping, right, of doing nothing. Um, and can you learn to pair it with, with cues? So we did this longitudinal training study. At baseline, we had people come in, in the scanner, uh, complete this, our task, we use the stop signal task, which I'll show you in a second. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. And then we also had other, other tasks. We had affective, sort of emotional control. Um, and we had other <laughs> behavioral measures of self-control because we really wanted to look at this transfer idea, right? If you get better at stopping on the stop signal task, we kind of expected that, right? You just practice effect. Um, but does it get better in other things too? So training session, uh, training group did the stop signal task, control group did stop signal task without stopping. So it becomes basically a two choice, you know, response time, you know, response task. Um, and then they came back after about three weeks. So, you know, it's modest sample size, about 60 people, 10 visits across three weeks. But, you know, this is really, sort of formative we think about this as like, can this work even in this ideal setting? Um, the stop signal task, it's very simple, looks like this. There's a cue, um, kind of like the yellow light, not really. I mean, it basically tells you the trial's about to start. You might need to stop soon. And then you see the go stimulus, okay? So it means press this button as fast as you can. Occasionally, about 20 to 25% of the time, you'll hear this uh, obnoxious tone. And when you hear that obnoxious tone, you need to try to stop. Um, and it's hard by design. Um, people get this, you know, ideally, actually, you get about 50% accuracy on this task. You adjust um, what's called the stop signal delay um, to make it harder or easier. So if somebody starts to do really well, you make the delay longer. 
Um, right, so it's like you hear the ghost stimulus, you're just about to press the button, and then you hear the obnoxious tone. Um, and we could look at this, uh, we could kind of break it up into this anticipation and execution phase. Um, and there are certain design considerations, you know, with fMRI in terms of trying to, you know, introduce some separation between those phases statistically. Here's our participants. Um, you know, they're young, uh, healthy, white college students. So uh, keep that in mind. So we do indeed see a practice effect. That was good. Um, not totally surprising. Um, people got better. Here's the sort of group by time interaction at baseline. These are University of Oregon undergraduates. They did fine. They got better uh, after practice. So that was encouraging. Uh, but our real questions were really about that mechanism, right? It's, well, mechanism and transfer. So first, what's happening at the level of the brain? Um, so we started with the kind of reactive control, which is the way you would normally analyze the stop signal task, right? What is happening when you stop, when you try to stop? Um, and what we see there, and this is what I'm showing you is uh, essentially a three-way interaction, right? It's the sort of stop greater than go trials uh, for the training group compared to the control group from, you know, change over time. So uh, this is essentially saying when you are stopping, what is changing in the, in the training group greater than in the control group? And what you see, I mean, somewhat surprisingly to us, is that you see uh, this sort of basal ganglia region, part of this motor control uh, loop that we know is, is involved in the kind of physical execution of this behavior. Um, but what's missing here are all of those lateral prefrontal, you know, anterior cingulate, lateral prefrontal, dorsolateral prefrontal, ventrolateral prefrontal, all the re brain regions that we sort of almost classically associate with stopping. Um, those are, are not there. Um, in fact, when we look at what decreases over time, um, that's where you get back the kind of rest of this network. Um, so in some sense, what's happening is, at least at the time that you're engaging control with training, is that we're seeing this dissociation among the, what I'm calling the classic stop network. If you just have naive participants just do the stop signal task, what you would see is essentially these plus this. I mean, that's often what you see. Um, and so what's happening is part of the network is going up, the part that's involved in engaging control, um, other part that's perhaps probably um, involved in representing the rules of the task, stuff like that, are actually decreasing over time. So at first we thought, oh, maybe this is an efficiency story. Um, maybe what's happening is that these regions are learning and they are now kind of automatically associating, you know, stopping with the cues and they hardly even need to come online. But then when we looked at what happens during anticipation, what you see are at least part of the, that same network um, increasing during anticipation, which actually fits pretty well with the, the Braver model. Um, it seems like what's happening is that the representation of the rules of needing to stop is coming online earlier. People are sort of preparing to stop and then actually executing it a little later in time. Um, and it turns out that that indeed kind of feeds back, um, that to the extent to which you saw increases in this region, um, training related increases in this region in the training group, you saw more activation in this, uh, in, in the kind of stopping network or the sort of motor stopping only in the training group, not in the control group. And this interaction was significant. So this was encouraging, right, to us. Um, it, it sort of said, here's what happens to this network with training, um, and here's a potential kind of mechanism that explains how the training is working. Interestingly to us, um, there was no, I, I almost gloss over this fact, but it was actually fascinating at the time, no uh, transfer effects whatsoever in any of the other tasks that we collected pre-post. You know, you, you get a little practice effect basically because everybody's doing it the second time by endpoint, but there's just like no difference at all between the groups. Um, and that was puzzling and frustrating, um, but for us, understanding what was happening um, under the hood, so to speak, helps uh, kind of explain it in a lot of ways, because if, if this really is an associative learning story that you're getting better at stopping because you are learning the rules, learning the cues that predict stopping, well then if you do a different task that has different cues, then it's not gonna transfer, right? It's like, we all know that yellow means slow down. If we went to some different country and the cue to means to say slow down was totally different, it wasn't yellow, it was a different color or in a different location, it really wouldn't help us. Right? It was like, we'd have to learn it you know, afresh each time. So no transfer, maybe this is why, but it also kind of suggests a, a possible tweak on this intervention that's saying, okay, well, maybe what we need to do is to play around with those cues. Maybe we need to build in more real world, you know, cues, put them into the training, and then we might see some transfer to other tasks. Makes sense to us. 
So my graduate training wasn't as good as Elliot's, other Elliot. Um, so I did not learn never to try to uh, rerun a successful experiment. Um, <coughs> I made the mistake of trying to do it again. So we did it again. We were encouraged by these results. We said, okay, I think we have a handle on what's going on. We got a bigger sample. We built in some personalized risk cues. Um, so this was a, a population of, of folks who were not, uh, didn't meet clinical threshold for anything. Um, uh, well, any, yeah, uh, substance use disorder. Um, but they self-reported having trouble with uh, you know, tobacco, with alcohol, uh, with overeating, and then um, we have this thing out west um, in Oregon. <laughs> you may have heard about it. Um, and we also overselected for people, folks who had high levels of, of early adversity, um, adverse early experiences based on the validity scale, um, and that's because we know uh, people who have early experiences um, such as those tend to have you know, impaired inhibitory control in certain ways. Um, so we thought, okay, let's great, you know, let's move out of this ideal lab setting and, and you know, target some people who, who probably, and we thought we were being um, kind of, you know, we thought this would be easy, right? We thought, okay, these people have already low levels of inhibitory control, so they should have more room to grow, right? That we'll see even bigger training effects. So we did this whole study. I should note, all the training did happen in the lab. So it's still really well controlled in the sense that we were literally looking over their shoulder while they were doing this task. And, and these, these folks could do it. Um, so what did we see? Again, this is time. Um, you know, sort of we had a couple of runs in the scanner. This is baseline. These last two runs are in the scanner at endpoint. And then the middle ones are the training runs. So only the training group will have data here because the control group just does that response time <laughs> task. Um, and then stop signal response time on the y-axis, which is, um, you know, it's, it's in RT units. So the, the, you know, smaller numbers mean faster stopping, kind of better stopping. And what I'm showing you is one big gigantic null effect. Um, you know, very adequately powered. So fortunately, we did a power analysis before, and we're actually hoping to publish these data. You know, basically saying, you know, the effect size. We would have detected the effect size if it were 0.03 or greater. Um, so, you know, if you care about an effect size of 0.02, then go for it. Um, otherwise, you know, we're we're like, okay, this is not working. Um, and so this was kind of frustrating to us. Um, no training effect at all. We haven't, I mean, these are actually pretty hot off the presses. Um, we're thinking it's highly unlikely to have transferred. We would be very surprised to see transfer effects, um, but we haven't looked at them yet. That's next. Um, and same, same way, the, the brain data are still being processed. Um, <clears throat> but again, we're not super optimistic. I mean, hopefully we'll at least see some evidence that there was that transfer or the shift that people are sort of learning to associate the cue with stopping. They're just not getting better. So we weren't deterred yet. We were like, okay, come on, let's, this has got to work. So we took a little smaller sample. We we're saying, okay, how about adolescents? Because we all know what's the story, right? Adolescents have bad inhibitory control because their brains aren't developed fully. Um, and uh, you know, they, they engage in all kinds of risky behavior. So again, this is a sample that ha should have room to grow in terms of inhibitory control. Um, again, we use personalized risk cues for these adolescents. Um, they weren't substance users so much as just general risk takey adolescents. Um, so for them, risk cues are peers. So we inserted pictures of peers into this training. Um, and we, I mean, I should also note in some of the, in the earlier study, they actually, the, the training task had sort of interleaved um, <coughs> conditions where it was, sometimes there were, there were risk cues, um, you know, drugs, alcohol, food, tobacco. And on those, when it was risk cues, there was a slightly higher probability of a stop signal. Um, and then there were control trials where they saw sort of neutral images where there was a slightly lower probability of stopping. We thought that would enhance the learning. Apparently not. Um, in this study, it was just all, all peer cues. That's correct, right? Yes, okay. Um, and this was delivered in the school setting. I say, uh, I was asking my student over there, Kate Beauchamp, who was the lead on this study, and she was the kind of intrepid researcher who went into the schools in this low SES school district and delivered the intervention. It's a computerized intervention, so she hauled you know five to six laptops into the school and set it up and ran this in the uh, in the break periods. Um, and these are kids that were nominated by their teachers as having self control issues. So once again, same deal. In this case, I'm not showing you the whole training slope. Um, but we have baseline, we have endpoint, stop signal. Again, sort of smaller numbers mean better stopping. Um, basically, null result. I mean, there is sort of a, this slope is significant in the training group. Um, this slope is not, and there's, but there's not a difference. So we're not seeing sort of better training in the training than the control, but, um, you know, not super strong effects. An interesting thing that did emerge from this 
was this question of to what extent is adverse childhood experience associated with inhibitory control at baseline? And our, our naive hypothesis coming in was that greater scores would mean worse, so higher numbers. Um, in fact, it was actually the opposite. We're not the first ones to have observed this effect, um, but it's, it's kind of an interesting note. Um, and it's the first indication to us that actually maybe going to these populations that would, uh, you know, uh, we would guess have trouble with inhibitory control on this task uh, might actually not. Um, they might be to some extent better for various reasons. So, okay, that's, uh, you know, enough on that. Um, um, yeah. Were the training effect the training effect was not related to childhood adversity, right? Yeah. Yeah, right. So it, this is just, this. sorry, this is at baseline. Yeah, thanks for the clarifying question. Yeah, and that was a question that we had also, was that would, the, you know, would people hire on ACEs have? Well, the other thing to note is this, you may be familiar with the ACEs measure. A score of, of three and a half is not particularly high. Um, we were a little surprised by that. These are, uh, they're what, 15 to 17 year olds. So they're almost, the ACEs questionnaire goes up to 18 years old. So they've had a lot of time to have these experiences, um, but you know they they haven't had as much as we would have guessed given this is sort of a somewhat you know low or very low SES school district outside of Eugene. <clears throat> um, so there's this evidence of, of what I'm calling the proactive shift, right? So people learn the cues um, in ideal conditions, right? Really ideal conditions. We think of uh, we, you know we sort of talk smack about our U of O undergrads all the time, um, but it turns out they actually are incredibly high functioning people, right? <laughs> They've graduated high school, they're going to college, they enrolled in, in the study that actually was really hard because they had to come to the lab 15 times, right? These are very high functioning people. So you can train it if you bring them to the lab and sort of look over their shoulder and do it. But subtle, what I consider pretty subtle deviations from that general training protocol make the result disappear altogether. Um, when we go out into populations of people who we think would need this the most, uh, when we go to settings where scalability would be realistic, like you know you wouldn't want to deliver everything in the lab, you'd want to be able to deliver it in schools or in primary care offices or something like that. Again, that's you know doesn't seem to be on the agenda. So I'm now pretty happy and ready to say it's it's time to abandon cognitive training, um, at least in terms of inhibitory control and self control. And I'm not the only one who's saying that. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it if I were the only one. Um, so here, there's recently been a lot of, um, yeah, actually a lot. Uh, Randy Engel and his colleagues um, have studied working memory for a long time and, and have repeatedly shown that there's really no training effects on working memory. Sometimes there's a practice effect, meaning on the exact same task you get better, but for the most part, it does not transfer and it does not endure beyond maybe a month or two. Um, and they've shown this over and over and over. More recent, this was a sort of large, you know, pre-registered uh, sample. Um, and this is also true in self-control. Um, here's something, a newish paper from Eleanor Miles and JEP General. Um, same deal where they said, okay, let's assume that the effect size is really tiny. Uh, you know, get a gigantic sample, train the heck out of them in every way we can. You know, pre-register everything. Nothing, just nothing. No training effects at all. So it's discouraging. Um, I mean, it's interesting theoretically, but as a kind of budding interventionist, it's discouraging. It's like, this just isn't working. And I do think, you know, usually researchers will stand up and say, well, we need to do more research. I, I mean, we do need to do more research, but maybe not on this. <laughs> maybe we can do something else. Um, I am no longer willing to use, you know, NIA, which actually funded that original study, their money or other people's money, um, to keep chasing this down. So, um, you know, what's next? I mean, in terms of behavioral training, I think there's slightly better evidence out in the literature for what people are calling response training. Um, so my colleague at Oregon Research Institute, Eric Stice, has done this a little bit. Um, here's some data from Russ Poldrack and Tom Schoenberg um, in the domain of eating. So these guys are training uh, obese or overweight people to learn to uh, basically go to healthy foods. So instead of stopping to unhealthy things, you go to healthy things. Somewhat of a subtle shift, but you know, sort of theoretically and from a sort of basic learning perspective, there's reasons to think that it would be easier to associate operantly, you know, behavioral response with a with a positive action, like going to you know doing something rather than not doing something. Um, so it's promising, but also note, I mean, the the effect sizes that they're showing here are are pretty modest um, in ideal conditions. So you know, after our training experiences, I'm a bitter cynic, and I'm thinking, okay. This is your effect size in the lab with ideal conditions. You know, it's like, what's gonna happen when we try to scale this or take this into a population where essentially the intervention feasibility is a little noisy. Um, but 
you know, that's yet to be determined. So that's one future direction, certainly for our lab, our next R01 that's starting um, soon. Well, the, one of the arms will be a response training intervention, and we're doing a lot of, uh, you know, everything we can do to make it as robust as possible, and especially including mixing up the training. So certainly not just one queue, but we're drawing queues from the sort of large database that we have. Okay, so let me just turn, you know, pivot shift a little bit to talking about the will, the motivational factors, which I think is more promising in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, I think thinking about why you do things um, rather than how to do them, in some ways, from the kind of RDoC perspective, it's more, it, it's potentially more domain general, right? You could argue that motivating to be healthy, if you're highly motivated to be healthy and you see the way that that can play out in different behaviors might be a pretty good intervention to sort of hit a range of different targets. Um, and so when I say motivation, I mean things like how much value you place on health or whatever the outcome is, um, how much you want it, how important it is to you, where it is in your sort of internal priorities list. It's also a prerequisite, and I'll argue, um, for many of the forms of behavior change that we're interested in, um, it's actually, in some ways, more important. <clears throat> yeah, for, I mean, eating is a good example, but I think, to some extent, smoking cessation falls under that category. You know, smokers, we all know, smokers all have successfully quit at some point, um, you know, for the most part. Everyone has these sort of, you know, partial periods of abstinence, so they know how. It's not a matter of, you know, not having the skills. Um, in, in, a, in a lot of ways, it's about uh, the will. And so the way we're thinking about motivation, I think James actually set this up really, really nicely, is um, from this behavioral economics perspective that motivation is a tricky thing to measure, but we can get a pretty good sense of people's priorities um, by their sense of subjective value or utility, um, or economists would just you know, basically say how much you're willing to pay for it. Um, that's a, a pretty good indicator of your priorities. Um, and you know, there's recently been a lot of work in this area it, from the decision-making world and um, you know, behavioral economics included, thinking about choice, um, including self-control kinds of choices, as the output of the value integration process, that you have these two options, usually it's just two, doesn't have to be, um, which one do you pick, right? Do I eat the salad or do I eat the burger or whatever? Um, well, it's, it, it's less about sort of a dual process, you know, hot versus cold, I mean, that plays in, but it's more just, you know, those choices have different attributes. And those attributes have different values to you. Um, and you can put a label on those things and basically figure out how much you value it um, by observing, you know, the behavior. Um, but you can also look in people's brains, too. So what I just said, in more jargony way, uh, there's sort of an arbitrary number of attributes, um, contribute dynamically, stochastically, right? So this kind of unfolds over time. And there's some really interesting work being done uh, well, I think probably the best, uh, this guy Ian Kravich, who is a, a student of Antonio Rangel's, um, looking at, for example, attention, right? What, just which of the you know, prop images or stimuli you happen to be focusing on in a given moment will, will push around this value signal as it unfolds over time. Um, and it eventually it kind of accumulates um, when it hits some threshold, some internal threshold that you have to make a decision, or you just run out of time, right? And, the, and you hit a time limit and it says, okay, well, whichever one has the higher value right now, um, that's the one I'm gonna pick. And you can look at um, you know, outcomes or behavior. In some ways, this is just revealed preferences 2.0. It's revealed preferences with brain imaging. <laughs> um, and so it looks something like this. You have a couple of options. You can imagine this one is the unhealthy option. This is the health, healthy option. And they all have different value inputs. Um, I think tangible inputs like something like money um, is really well studied and really well understood. You know, if you pay people to act in healthy ways, they, they generally do it, right? Um, I mean, that's what contingency management comes down to. People respond to these incentives. Um, but as a social psychologist, it, it really fascinates me that, you know, tangible rewards, including money, you know, primary rewards, effort, costs, uh, seem to be really important. There's a lot of other things that factor into this decision besides just money. Money is easy to study because it's quantifiable. Um, but there's things like social factors, right? For a long, long time, social psychologists have studied things like social norms, right? If I know that the people I'm having lunch with really think eating healthy is, is uh, you know, an important thing to do and I care what those people think, well, that's going to have some subjective value for me, right? I, I might change my behavior. I might value the salad a little more because I, I know I'm being watched by people um, who have these kind of you know, expectations. There's also self-related ones. Um, again, from the social psychology literature, we, we place a lot of emphasis on having kind of co coherency and consistency and self-worth. Um, and so maybe 
it's less about who's watching me, um, or in addition to who's watching me and how much it's costing me, um, there's also some kind of self-image that I have to maintain, essentially. Right? If I think I'm a healthy person, why am I ordering the burger? Right? That would cause cognitive dissonance if I did that. Um, especially if somebody pointed that out to me right at the moment and said, oh wait, no, I'm a kind of healthy person, I'm going to order the healthy salad. And for humans, there seems to be some inherent intrinsic value in that. Um, in kind of conf uh, affirming and, and enacting on important domains of our identity. So that, and then that gets kind of integrated in this uh, dynamic, you know, stochastic process. Uh, <clears throat> and then we enact some action. So what is this integration process? Here's kind of a cartoon version of what uh, you might hear called the drift diffusion model or an evidence accumulator model. There's a bunch of these out there right now, um, but this is kind of the idea. So over time, you're presented with two options. Maybe they start out equally valued, not necessarily, right? Sometimes we have sort of existing, maybe attitude, right, about <laughs> something already, but let's suppose they start out. Um, and as, as time unfolds, the value of this one kind of goes up and then goes down. This one sort of accumulates more slowly. So if I had a high threshold for a decision, like I won't choose anything until it gets to, you know, two evidence points. Well, then I would choose option B. If I had a lower threshold or I was forced to choose under a deadline, you know, but let's say there was a deadline here, well, I would probably choose this one. Um, and so it's, it's models like these that have kind of indicated to people that you can get what, what essentially are preference reversals um, or maybe what looks like a dual system, dual process model where you have like hot things and cold things sort of fighting. Um, you can say, well, those, you can explain those kinds of outcomes using uh, this value integration process just by looking at these different parameters. And here the idea is, I think this is maybe something more hedonic that accumulates evidence really quickly, um, but then as you start to really think about it, maybe its value goes down, whereas this is something that doesn't really have any immediate value, but as you start to think about it a little bit, it kind of gets more valuable. Um, and at the level of the brain, we now know quite a bit um, by a bunch of folks. Um, Antonio Rangel and his group is one of them, um, Joe Cable, Joe McGuire. Um, so we have, um, so here would be an example of how you would look at this. You have people kind of rating the healthiness of a bunch of individual food items in this case. So first you rate the food. So we know a sense of sort of how healthy you think everything is. Separately then, you rate the tastiness of a bunch of food items. Um, and then in this kind of, this is the critical decision block here. You make a choice um, about each and every food item. And it's a real choice in the sense that one of them will be selected and, and actually enacted. So you will you know, actually pay for one of these things if you, if you think it's more valuable than some sort of neutral uh, comparator. We'll draw this at random. And you, you, know, you can follow some nice behavioral economics rules and do it through a bidding process so that really your optimal uh, behavior in this case is to just bid what you actually value the food at. Right? If you really do want this thing, you should bid you know, high for it, something like that. Um, and as people make these decisions, there's a, a bunch of interesting things you can look at, um, but they consistently find activity in this uh, ventral medial prefrontal cortex region um, and a couple of other regions as well that, that are kind of midline dopamine regions um, that scale with the value that you place on things, but they also scale with the, the decision, right? That essentially how healthy you rate something and um, how you know, the extent to which health drives the decision uh, correlate pretty highly. Um, so I won't unpack this fully, but the idea is that to the extent that this region is active, um, it sort of drives choice, and it seems like what's happening is that activity in that region is, is accumulating evidence on multiple attributes, so not just health, not just taste, but you know, to some combination of them. Um, and here's a nice paper um, from, from uh, I, I mentioned before, Joe McGrandjo Cable's lab, um, looking at this conjunction of, this is from a meta-analysis, looking at you know, what are the regions in the brain that seem to track in you know, a positive value across a bunch of different kinds of outcomes um, when you're thinking about things, when you receive them, and you get that same region. So at this point, there's, there's actually good evidence that this, this is sort of where this uh, integration process happens. Maybe it's not the only place that it happens. Um, so there's now some really interesting data showing uh, effort costs are being integrated in the dorsal anterior cingulate. It's from Amitai Shenhav's lab. Um, so it's possible that there's kind of value integrations that happen at, at different levels of the decision. So there might be an integration for effort that somehow sort of communicates to the integration of, of ultimate decision value. Um, but we pretty rapidly turn to this question of how can you push value around? Uh, we know, I mean, from Warren Bickle and many others, as we heard, 
you know, you can push around with contingency management, um, and that that affects the value that people place on these outcomes because um, you're you're literally adding you know sort of dollar value. Um, but as social psychologists, we were wondering if we can we can do something with with these kind of self-related ones, and and we think about that because they're more sustainable, right? Sort of contingency management famously lasts, you know, it, it, it doesn't necessarily last any longer than the contingencies do, right? Once you stop paying people, it kind of, you know, lingers for a while, but eventually goes away. Whereas something like identity um, from a scalability perspective is really attractive because it's, it's cheap, right? Um, but it's also, you know, sort of more self-sustaining. So we ran this intervention where the goal was to basically do this, right? Is to say, you know, you have your self-concept, your, your image of yourself, that's what we would call identity. Um, and then there's this, this abstract value of health. And can we have you kind of integrate those two things to some extent? And so the way we um, went around testing this is we had, uh, you know, brought in a sample of people. In this case, the target behavior is healthy eating. We delivered this intervention that I'll tell you about in a second for about a month. Um, we looked at change across the month, but then we also looked at whether it endured at three and six months. And at all these time points, or sorry, just at the initial time point, we had brain imaging, and then all these time points, we had tasks to assess uh, your kind of health-related identity and your the value that you place on uh, healthy eating. So, what did this intervention look like? Well, it was based on principles from social psychology that said here are the kind of internal self-related things that should have positive value for people. And here, if you were to ask a, a social psychologist, you know, how do you sort of make something intrinsically valuable? Well, talk about abstract core values. So health is an example. Um, you know, a lot of people will say family is really important to me. Integrity is really important to me. Uh, you know, maybe safety or security, right? Some big high level abstract ideals um, that we all are capable of, of talking about and, and listing. Um, autonomy is a big piece of this. So feeling like you freely chose to engage in a behavior as opposed to being forced to do it uh, seems to add some value to it. Economists might call that the endowment effect, right? When I own something, it has more value, you know, basically for no reason. I mean, maybe it's loss aversion, um, but essentially, you know, once I already have something, it has some value. And that, I think that includes abstract uh, properties like, like core values. Uh, Self-relevance, um, so that it needs to feel directly relevant to me. Um, and then those things kind of add up to being intrinsic. So the way we did this was we had people affirm their core values. So tell me about, you know, here's a list of uh, 12 abstract values, they're all positive things. People value them differently, so tell me what your top three are and write about them. And then we'll have you author 60 or so brief messages that explain how those values are linked to healthy eating. Um, so this resembles motivational interviewing in a lot of ways, right? Sort of a self-persuasion kind of thing. Tell me, you know, you said family's really important to you. Um, you know, why, or in the case I'll show you, you said achievement is really important to you. How is achievement related to health? And so here's a, a verbatim message that a participant composed. Um, your success will be short-lived if you're not around to enjoy it. So good point. Um, for somebody that really values achievement, I could see this being really persuasive, especially because it's, it's all these things, right? It's related to her core value. Um, it's autonomy in the sense that she actually wrote this message. Um, it's relevant to her. Presumably she's intrinsically motivated for achievement, even if she's not intrinsically motivated to attain health, right? That's kind of the important thing. We're bringing health into that sort of self-concept. Um, and then they get those messages, just verbatim. Um, and, you know, they receive these messages for 28 days. Here's how we measured identity in the scale. This is, uh, sorry, in the scanner. It's kind of a new uh, take on this task. And so we, we told people what we mean by this. Um, do you identify with this food? What does that mean? So it's like, I might show you a piece of bacon. Do you think of yourself as a bacon person? Is, it, is bacon important to who you are, right? And which, it, it sounds funny, but like people can totally do this, right? It's like, are you a bacon person, right? I don't know, I, I, you know I'm not a bacon person. Um, you know, I'm Jewish, so it's like, my, my people are not a bacon people. But if you showed me you know, a picture of a black and white cookie, yes, totally part of my self-concept, right? So pizza, do you identify with it? Yes, no. Salmon, yes, no. Right, so there's a whole bunch of different foods. Um, and our control condition was just, is this served hot, right? So, you know, is, this, is, is yogurt served hot, or french fries served hot? So people could do this, and we got this really nice contrast of like, you know, when you're thinking about, is it, are you this kind of person versus is it hot or cold? That's how we measure identity. How do you measure value? Well, value, we borrowed this task from, um, you know, neuroeconomics uh, literature. 
how much would you pay to eat this food? Um, and the, the procedure is like you get some endowment before the scan, you know, we're giving you $3. These people haven't eaten for four hours, so you're gonna get, you can buy a food in the scanner. This is the only food you're gonna get. Um, and in, in order to get it, you need to bid, you know, and we're gonna randomly select a number. And if your bid is higher than that number, then you get the food and you actually pay for it. Otherwise, you, so it's, it's kind of elaborate, but psychometrically it's really nice because the optimal strategy in these kinds of tasks is bid what the food is actually worth to you, right? You can't game it. Um, how much would you pay? So we did this conjunction and we consistently see, this is true in Neurosynth too, if you look at identity and value, um, there's quite a bit of overlap here in this MPFC region as you might expect. Um, so that was nice to see, just to say, okay, this is sort of a sanity check. Um, and the question is, does this really predict anything, right? Does the, the extent to which you see, uh, or basically do we see changes at three and six month follow-up over time? So what I'm gonna show you is the bidding. So this is just the value measure. Um, we saw some change in identity, but the real kind of the outcome is we're trying to get people to value these healthy foods more and the unhealthy foods less. So on the y-axis, I'm showing you the difference in the average bid. There were changes separately in healthy and unhealthy, but it's just easier for visualization purposes to show the difference. And what you see is at baseline, um, you know, they, there was essentially no difference between the groups and how much they differ. In general, you should know people do value the healthy foods more than the unhealthy foods by about 60 cents. Um, but over time, that grows in the experimental group, and it seems to endure pretty well. Um, we're going to also have a one-year follow-up. So that was kind of interesting to us. At least it's an initial step that you can push this around um, basically by lassoing in things that are already important to people, lassoing in like health, uh, the value of these health foods. So I want to argue that value-based choice, I think, is, is a reasonable model at the psychological, computational, neural levels for self-control. You know, it's not everything, but I think it gives us a handle. It's a way of, of linking, you know, economic models and behavioral <laughs> models and neural models in a nice way. Um, we do need, uh, from the kind of psychological perspective, a better taxonomy of attributes and values. Um, so in a given situation, for a given person, what are the sources of value? What are the relevant attributes, right? I kind of have an initial taxonomy, but I, we really don't know, right? Sort of a priori, what are the forces that are acting on somebody in a situation other than just money? Um, obviously money is important, but even when you control for that, why would somebody choose one thing or the other? You know, social psychology would place emphasis on the social context and the in intrapersonal context, but I'm sure there are others, right? We really don't have a systematic way of assessing that. Um, Identity-related manipulations are promising. Um, there are several others in my lab, <clears throat> excuse me, that I didn't have time to talk about, but we're sort of working on this and working on refining them in various ways. So um, just to wrap up, I'll talk about adopting this translational approach to behavior change, translating, in this case, from sort of basic psychology and neuroscience work into more applied contexts, um, not without its challenges, as you, as you all know, but I think that's sort of the important direction for my lab is to think about not just can we get this effect in a lab with undergrads, but you know, can we push it out into the real world? I mean, to me, that's kind of the effect of, not so much the effect size, but the robustness, right? It's like if I make some small tweak to my paradigm and it goes away, how important could that thing really be, right? Um, I mean, not so much from the, the kind of theoretical perspective, but in terms of you know, public health interventions. Uh, we need to consider the feasibility, scalability, and fit to the groups. I think I'm preaching to the choir here, but in case there are any, I mean, this is APS, right? So if there, if there are any psychology researchers out there, right? Think about the groups. We've got to stop studying undergrads. Um, <laughs> I mean, they're great rats, right? But they're like, it, this happens in animal research too, right? If you guys, have you heard about the whole gut microbiome thing? And you can grow these rats that literally have, they have zero, right? Germ-free rats, no microbiome. But again, it's like, how realistic is that, right? I mean, is that going to be, you know, once, it, you know, how can we generalize? We, it's, it's hard. Um, and I'm saying identity changes, change interventions may be promising uh, because they're very low cost, uh, certainly compared to something like contingency management. Um, and we're not, I mean, I shouldn't pit these like against contingency management, right? The model is maybe contingency management plus identity plus social would be like the most powerful, right? Sort of try to hit all the different levels of valuation. Um, they can be highly personalized and intrinsic, um, and they're pretty sustainable in the sense that one, you know, at some point these interventions can be done completely online, right? You go to some website, you rank your values, do some writing, and then we'll just send you text messages. We don't, we don't ideally wouldn't necessarily need to have contact with these participants. Okay, um, I want to give a specific, you know, special shout out to my collaborators. Um, this is on the cognitive training work. The original, that sort of first study was with Lauren and Junaid. 
um, Kate Beauchamp, uh, who's here now, has um, did the this her dissertation study was was in the schools, um, and then uh, the the study with the middle aged adults was Krista Stasio and Kelsey Schaefer. The collaborators um, the work on the will. We have a couple of papers out, uh, theory papers. One in current directions coming out next month. Um, with this group here, Sendry has done the heavy lifting on, on the kind of drift diffusion model side of things. Um, and Nicole Giuliani uh, does, was the lead on the, the eating study that I just showed you where we had six month follow up. So thank you very much for your attention. And I think we have some time for questions. I hope dissonance is good. It can produce behavior change. <laughs> Are you, are you saying with cognitive behavioral therapy. therapy work? Well, I mean, we know it works for depression. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if this model applies. The model is very focused on choice, right? So I think it, it applies well to, to, to many forms of addiction um, where it's essentially, you know, you're trying to get people to choose different things. Um, I mean, I think the probably the nearest parallel in terms of, of access one, you know, sort of mood disorders uh, would be what behavioral activation therapy, which in some ways very much is like, you're, you know, you're depressed, you may be depressed, you know, we're not disputing that, but we still just want you to do this thing, right? We want you to go out and just go to a movie, right? Go, you know, have a have dinner with a friend, right? And, and those can be reasonably effective. I mean, I probably somebody who knows better, like if you directly compared CBT versus behavioral activation, right? I mean, I know there's evidence that behavioral activation is effective, and I think that would, the, the, this model would sort of suggest that that would be one good way to go, partly because it does induce some level of dissonance, right? It's like, I don't want to go out, but I'm going out. Why am I going out? Well, maybe, maybe I do want to go out, right? Um, I mean, it, that's essentially what, you know, cognitive dissonance is, and to the extent that you think that, like, just the behavior, engaging in those behaviors is, is a key, it certainly is a feature of depression, it's not the only thing, but then, yeah, I mean, I think this model would, would, would kind of address it that way. Martin? Just a comment, I, I wouldn't totally uh, uh, ditch studying undergraduates, we know that about 30, <laughs> there's, been, there's about 30% of undergraduates have moderate depressive symptoms, and it's the number one reason why kids drop out of college. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, and I'm, I'm saying this because I think it's important to not see this as one block of individuals. Right. Because, um, often college kids are seen as just sort of what you said, lab rats, but they really actually are right. uh, distributed on those domains. Mm -hmm. And I think it will be important to kind of keep that in mind. Yeah, no, absolutely correct. So Martin's point, it, it's well taken. What I was, I mean, I was clearly being glib, but I also was sort of saying like, if you're trying to study inhibitory control problems, undergrads probably are not your best population. Um, right, but certainly for something like alcohol use, right, and certain other risk behaviors, they're great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great presentation. Thanks. Uh, my question is about this sort of value integration, sort of like information processing. Mm -hmm. Do you do that as dual conscious or do you have to all conscious or is the fact that right. it's not bad? That's a really good question. I mean, I think it's a blend. Um, I think from the perspective of this model, the distinction between you know what Khan would call it, you know system one and system two processing is kind of a red herring. It's sort of like it doesn't matter as much like whether something is conscious or unconscious. The, what matters is essentially sort of how much and when it gets into the process. And so clearly the timing matters, right? We know that. So things that happen faster are gonna are gonna have a stronger influence earlier <coughs> versus things that accumulate more slowly. So from that perspective, it's important. But like in terms of trying to say, what I'm contrasting with it is the sort of classic, you know, um, you know, hot versus cold model, where the hot thing is always the sort of, in, you know, the bad <laughs> outcome, and the cold thing is always the good outcome. Think about something like social influence, right? When I'm sitting there, sure, there's the burger, right? It's hot in the sense that there's a hedonic value. I know it will taste good. There's the abstract representation of like, I know it's healthier. And, and clearly those abstract representations are pretty top down, you know, system two. But then there's something like social influence. Like I sort of have a sense that people around me wouldn't, would sort of be disappointed if I, you know, ordered something unhealthy or whatever, right? And that, it's like, is that hot or cold or automatic or it doesn't really matter, right? It's what matters is like, that is a factor, right? To, to for, for many people in that context. Does that address your question? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.